swords and battles and armor and, you know, and I always would think about, man, wouldn't it have been cool to live back in? Like, no, man, they didn't have no running water. They didn't have no toilets. I mean, they didn't have, you know, air conditioning. I'm like, no, but, but you know, uh, I, used, <laughs> I used to think that way. But no, I am here, right here, right where God has placed me in this day, in this age, not back in the night's days when they were, you know, uh, starving and didn't have, you know, clean food. I don't. Anyways, we're here. You're here. And I thank God you're here because I believe God has put you here for such a time as this. Amen? Well, glory be to God. I just got a few things I want to remind you of. We are having an agape uh, work day on August 5th. A church, so we have, as a church, I committed <laughs> the church, you all, <laughs> to help the Agape Center on a workday, August 5th. There's a sign-up sheet out there in the lobby. So if you can get free, it's a Saturday. Even if you come for an hour, listen, just an hour out of your day to come and uh, help that tremendous ministry that's doing a lot of good work. And it's growing, church. It is growing. It's, uh, it is definitely growing, and they need to, uh, uh, to they need some help. They just need some help. And then the other date I want to remind you of is uh, August 13th. We're going to have our uh, annual church picnic, but we are actually doing it a little bit different. We're not going to meet here on August 13th. We're going to meet out at Clater Lake. We'll be at Pavilion Number 5, and we're going to have our church service out there. We'll have a meal out there, and we're going to have baptisms. we got several people that are interested in getting baptized, so we're going to baptize you in the lake. How many like natural water sources? I like it. You know, there's nothing wrong with being baptized in a pool or in a trough, uh, especially if it's a horse trough. But uh, there's nothing wrong with that at all. But there's something about, I, you know, I got baptized down in the North Fork River. Uh, I've got a picture of it on my uh, bookcase in here, Pastor Rob, and uh, baptized me down there. And it just was special to me. It was special to me. And so I believe that the natural environment, it just makes it special. Uh, so we had one, let's see. Caleb was baptized in a in a baptistry, a baptistry like your standard, you know, tub. Uh, Kenneth was baptized in a in a lake, and then Levi was baptized in a trough, probably horse trough or something. So we've we've got it spread out everywhere, every which way. I was in a river, so where were you baptized? In a pool. So we got all bases covered with our family. So, <laughs> but uh, August thirteenth, don't forget. So. Um, the church will be providing the main course. If you'll just bring some sides, I think we're going to have chick. So, so we are providing chicken. Bring sides to go with chicken. Listen, I listen. I love all the desserts that come. All I'm asking is limit the desserts. Because i got to eat the, all this leftover, okay? So, you know, I take that stuff home with me. And uh, But no, uh, just let's have a lot of sides. And we're going to have a good time. I, I prefer, I would love to see people hang out in the park. Just make a day of it. I, the church is going to pay the entrance fee, okay? There is a $7 entrance fee per vehicle. So if you want to carpool, that'd be great. Anybody that wants to carpool, Come on and jump in with others, and the church will pay that fee to get in, so it won't cost you anything, and you'll be able to stay in the park all day long uh, after that. Now, if you got kids and they want to go to the beach area, I think it is a separate fee, like 2 $3 or something like that. But uh, we'll have the pavilion all day. Um, there's uh, Anyways, that's enough about that. So come on out. We want to be, make a, a big time of it <clears throat> and, and do baptisms out there. That's going to be awesome. I'm looking forward to it. Last announcement. Nikki and I are going to be out the next two Sundays. So we got Brother Reggie bringing the word the first Sunday and Brother Patrick Carden bringing the word that second Sunday. Um, we're, going to, we're going to try and relax and get some downtime. Uh, and it's refreshing time. So, you know, I know a lot of people, and we don't do, I don't do um, a lot of conferences. I try to do at least one a year, if not more, but... Uh, I'm telling you, when Jesus said he went off to a lonely mountain and got refreshed, that's what brings refreshing to me. Uh, when I can get away uh, alone in a quiet place, um, it, it, that's what brings refreshing to me. And so we're just very excited to be able to get away and have some time of refreshing. And 
I know it is in good hands. Y'all are in good hands with Reggie and Patrick. Amen? All right. I think that's all I got. You got anything else? No? Praise God. All right, we've been talking about occupy until I come, right? Occupy until I come, and it's funny, uh, you know, and, and that we're to be busy, uh, be busy bearing fruit. And just last week I said, you know, I don't normally do series, but here I am. This is, I think, the third Sunday I've been talking about bearing fruit. And the Lord just keeps me here, and I believe He's shown me something uh, not new. I mean, it's in His Word, but He's uh, allowed me to share something with you today. And I believe, I believe there is someone here, if just one person, I'm telling you, if just, you know, he says, leave the 99, go get the one, right? If just one person gets revelation about this today, it will change your life. I believe that. And I believe there's someone here that it will be revelatory to you. So get your ears on. Y'all got your ears on? Spirit of the Lord gives you ears to hear what he is saying so we're talking about occupying till he comes. We said chin up, Jesus is on your side. Just a little reminder what we were talking about. Talking about bearing fruit in the world and what that looks like. And so today I want to go at it from a different angle. How many know that one of the names of God is the multifaceted one? That is one of his names. That's one of his attributes. He's multifaceted. It is one word, but it... it, it how many know, how many know, uh, and I've shared this before, but how many know when you're talk when, when someone is ministering and they're saying the same thing, but the person beside you may draw something completely different from that one word? Well, that's what we're talking about. And, and so uh, I believe that this is a, a different perspective on bearing fruit in your life. And I think it ties it. Teresa, let me put you on the spot here. That third, third song, the second from the end song. Will you put that first verse up? Second from the end song, I forget the name of it. Whatever that second from the end one we did, and that first verse. Thank you for the cross, Lord. Thank you for now the one before that, the song before that. Raise a hallelujah, I think it was. Yes. I raise a hallelujah in the presence of my enemies. Just just take this in. I raise a hallelujah louder than the unbelief. How many know when you got first saved, born again, you had to believe something? And you had to believe that something. You can leave that up. You had to believe that something by faith. By faith. You know, what do you have other than the Word of God and the uh, presence of the Holy Spirit ministering to you, uh, there is no written guarantee uh, other than the Word of God. I, I mean, like a contract that you sign saying, if you make this decision, all is going to be well. Don't worry. Your future. It's by faith that we receive that when you get born again. So when you say, I raise a hallelujah louder than the unbelief, We've got that, that to me that applies action, right? You have it's actionable. You there is a lot of stuff going on around each one of us in our lives, and we got to shout the hallelujah louder than the stuff sometimes. And, and I don't mean that necessarily in a physical shout, or you'd be shouting, you know, in the in, in at work and in, in, in the movie theater, and that wouldn't go over well. It's okay if you shout in here, yeah. hallelujah. It's okay, all right? It is okay. I just want to give you all permission. You know, if, if, if the Lord ministers to you in the moment and you just got to get it out, you shout it out. Hallelujah! Okay. All right, we got that clear. Can you turn that air down in here? I am burning up. I'm sorry. Just a couple degrees, maybe. Um, so, sometimes it's a difficult road. Sometimes it's a difficult road. And how do we bear fruit in the difficulties. How do we do that? Well, uh, the other side of this and what I want to look at is our difficulty that we're experiencing can actually benefit others and help them to bear fruit. And I want you to see how you can bear fruit from that. So turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 1 and let's examine this through the eyes of Paul. 
You know, if you just think about that, that statement, you know, uh, uh, difficulty can benefit others and bear fruit. If you think in the natural, just a fruit tree, in order for that fruit tree to produce more fruit, sometimes it needs to be pruned. It needs to be cut back. You know, these beautiful uh, knockout roses you see out in front of the church. You know, Dusty does an awesome job at keeping those and maintaining them, but he has to prune them. He has to cut the old ones off sometimes so that they will bear more flowers, bear more fruit. So in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, and I want to read and start in verse 1, and I'm going to read down to at least 7, probably 7 there. It says, uh, and this is out of the New Living Translation. It says, This letter is from Paul, chosen by the will of God to be an apostle of Christ Jesus and from our brother Timothy. I'm writing to God's church. He's writing to us in Corinth. Now, we're not in Corinth, but we are God's church. And to all of His holy people throughout Greece, may God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ give you grace and peace. May He give you grace and peace right now, right where you are, in the name of Jesus. Verse 3, all praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is our merciful Father, and the source of all comfort. That word comfort, I want you to take notice of it. And as I read down through these seven verses, look at how many times it's mentioned in these seven verses, or actually four more. But it says that who is the source of all comfort? God is the source of... Of all comfort. Listen, it ain't your Aunt B. It ain't social media. It ain't alcohol. It ain't sex. It ain't none of those things are going to bring you the comfort like God can bring to you because He is the source of all comfort. All comfort comes from Him. Verse 4 says, He comforts us in all all our troubles so that we can comfort others. If you will allow, He will comfort you in all your troubles. No matter what you are going through today, tomorrow, what you've been through already, it says that He will comfort you in all of those troubles. Why? So that you can comfort others. And that's what I want to talk about today. That's what we're talking about. Bearing fruit, even when we are suffering, even when we go through suffering, trials and tribulation, uh, we can, God can use that working through us to help others that may be going through something similar. And that is how you bear fruit in suffering. So let's continue reading here in verse 5. For the more we suffer for Christ, the more God will shower us with His comfort through Christ. Even when we are weighed down with troubles, it is for your comfort and salvation. For when we ourselves are comforted, we will certainly comfort you. Then you can patiently endure the same things we suffer. We are confident that as you share in our sufferings, you will also share in the comfort God gives us. I don't know if you counted, but nine times he used that word comfort in that passage. And what he is saying is the troubles and trials and tribulation and suffering that you experience in your life, you can use, he will use that through you to help someone else. And that is bearing fruit. That word comfort is the Greek word Paraklesis, paraklesis, paraklesis. And it means a calling to one's aid, encouragement, or comfort. It also means an intimate call that someone personally gives to deliver God's verdict. That is the close call that reveals how the Lord weighs in the relevant facts or evidence. We know from Hebrews, the definition of, Uh, 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 of faith says the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. 
Just like when you received Christ. There was nothing, you know, in the physical realm about that. It was a spiritual decision. It was a decision you made by faith. You know, it's not like I just <laughs> I just watched I don't I don't know why I did, but my son rented Super Mario Brothers movie. <laughs> and so he had already rented it, so I watched it. And I don't know if you're familiar with that, but it's a gaming it's a game, Super Mario Brothers, you know, where Luigi and Mario jump around and, and uh, they punch stuff and they get these gold coins and, and benefits and stuff. It's not like that. You don't punch something and get some evidence. You know, you make that decision. You believe, and that is the evidence. That is the substance within you. Faith. That faith to believe. We receive by faith that God is our source of all comfort. You have to believe that by faith. You have to know that by faith, that He is your source. He is your source of all comfort in anything that you can possibly dream of going through. He is your source of comfort. There is comfort there for you. He sent the Comforter, right? When Jesus went up to be at the right hand of the Father, He sent the Comforter, to be with us. The definition of that word par paraclesis goes on and says, this holy urging is used of the Lord directly motivating and inspiring believers to carry out His plan, delivering His particular message to someone else. The core meaning is personal urging and is shaped by the individual context so it can refer to exhortation, warning, Encouragement and comfort. And comfort. Paul is expressing the difficulties he has been through to the Corinthians and how he was comforted, and he is passing that on to us. So even in our troubles, we can be comforted. Even in our troubles, we can be comforted by faith. Think about Abraham when he was going to he was going up the mountain to sacrifice his only son, the one that God had promised him. You parents, just think of it from a from a parent's mind. You know, God asking you to sacrifice your child, the child of promise. You know, I think about uh, Glenn and Bridget Valentine. And I remember Pastor Rob sharing the story how, uh, and, and this, is all, this is all public knowledge, how, how uh, uh, Bridget couldn't have children. I mean, the doctor had told her, I believe, that she could not and would not have children. But then here comes Michael. And not only Michael. <laughs> here comes two more after that. You know, uh, so here's, here's Abraham. He's going up the mountain. And, and, and Isaac's saying to him, Dad, you know, I know we're going up here to sacrifice, but where's the sacrifice? What does he say? God will provide the sacrifice. And Abraham said to himself, you know, uh, God, you gave me this child, but by faith I know that you can raise him up again if I have to continue to perform what you've asked me to do. I will be obedient. Faith. Faith. And that God is the source of our comfort. Comfort. Right up to the brink of breaking. And as we are comforted experiencing pain and loss, we can comfort others who have gone through similar things ahead of them. Look at Ephesians chapter 2. They're scriptural for this. It's, it, 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 this is our, Jesus is our example. And so if you look at Ephesians chapter 2, it tells us Jesus has already taken paths ahead of time to prepare us. Chapter 2, verse 10 says, and this is beyond the Amplified. I will jump a little bit back and forth. It says, for we are God's own handiwork, His workmanship, recreated in Christ Jesus, born anew, that we may do those good works which God predestined, planned beforehand for us, taking paths which He prepared ahead of time, that we should walk in them, living the good life which He prearranged and made ready for us to live. 
And it also says, you know, where it says Jesus was tempted in all things. He was tempted in all things that we can experience. He is a faithful and true high priest who has been tempted in all things. He's experienced everything that we can experience and has given us a way, a way out. And he has said that God is the source of all comfort. So when you're in the middle of something, when you're in the middle of that trial, that that tribulation, and how many have been, listen, I, I can speak from experience. I've been in a situation where I couldn't see the way out. I couldn't see the way out. I, I was drowning. I was suffocating. And I couldn't see the way out. But there is always a way, and He will always make a way when you trust in Him, when you believe in by faith that He is the source of your comfort. And He will comfort you. He will show you. He will lead and guide you and give you a way out. The Holy Spirit will the one dwelling on the inside of you. Hebrews 4, 15, I'll just read it. says that. It says, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to understand and sympathize and have a shared feeling with our weaknesses and infirmities and liability to the assaults of temptation, but one who has been tempted in every respect as we are yet without sinning. Let us then fearlessly, this is, what, this is what this provides. When you get a revelation that he is, he is your source of all comfort, this is what it provides in verse 16. Let us then fearlessly and confidently and boldly draw near to the throne of grace, the throne of God's unmerited favor to us sinners, that we may receive mercy for our failures and find grace to help in good time for every need appropriate help and well-timed help coming just when we need it. How many know you've heard it, if not once, a thousand times, especially here, God is always on time. He's never late. He's never early. He is always on time. We're the ones that miss the boat sometimes. (laughs) We're the ones that get ahead of ourselves sometimes. But He is always right on time. And if you will trust, you know, I don't know if you've been through anything where you were at the breaking point. You know, I was just talking to some people the other day and all with similar life experiences that had brought them to the brink of breaking. And I'm talking detrimental breaking. I don't know if you've experienced anything similar where you've been, I mean, at the the bottom of the barrel, rock bottom. There wasn't any lower you could go. And then something happened. Either someone came alongside of you and shared something with you or you heard something somewhere or faith rose up from the inside and pulled you out of that place. I don't know if any of you have experienced that. I have. I know that it's real. But I know that God is my source. And that is whom I trust. That is what I rely on and in. He is my strong. This is who He is to me. Turn to Psalm 91. We haven't done this in a while. I want to read Psalm 91. Because some of us need to hear it and get encouraged with it. I need it. And I'm going to read it out of the King James. I know it's probably a little wordy for y'all. But I want to just read Psalm 91. Because someone needs to be encouraged today. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God. In Him will I trust. Surely He shall deliver thee from the snare of the fowler and from the noisome pestilence. He shall cover thee with His feathers, and under His wings shalt thou trust. His truth shall be thy shield and buckler. Thou shalt not be afraid for the terror by night, nor for the arrow that flieth by day, nor for the pestilence that walketh in darkness, 
nor for the destruction that wasteth at noonday. A thousand shall fall at thy side, and ten thousand at thy right hand, but it shall not come nigh thee. Only with thine eyes shalt thou behold and see the reward of the wicked. Because thou hast made the Lord, which is my refuge, even the Most High, thy habitation. There shall no evil befall thee, neither shall any plague come nigh thy dwelling. For he shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee in all thy ways. They shall bear thee up in their hands, lest thou dash thy foot against a stone. Thou shalt tread upon the lion and adder, the young lion and the dragon shalt thou trample under feet. Because he hath set his love upon me, because you, child of God, have set your love upon God, therefore he will deliver you. It says, I will set him on high, because he hath known my name. He shall call upon me and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. With long life will I satisfy him and show him my salvation. That is a promise for you. And you, child of God, need to embrace that and believe it by faith and watch it at work in your life. That is so comforting to me to read those words and let them just saturate my soul. So no matter what you're going through today, understand that He is the source of all comfort for you. He has placed the Holy Spirit. You, he abides in you. You are the temple of the Holy Spirit. And He leads and guides you. And it says that He comforts you. He will comfort you. And when He does, when He takes you from that place of despair, that place where you think you couldn't get back from, then you have a responsibility. I would say a responsibility to share with others that are going through something similar to help them in their time of need. And that is bearing fruit in your life. Now let's take it a little bit further. Turn to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. I'm going to read this will be out of the New Living. There will be quite a few quite a few verses here. Um, starting in verse 18. Romans 8, 18. Paul's talking to the church at Rome. Now, he had never been to the church at Rome at this point, and so he shared this letter with them, hearing of their great faith and things that they've done. And he says in verse 18, Yet what we suffer now is nothing compared to the glory He will reveal to us later. You know, I, I did a message, it's been years now, called, uh, it was eternity-minded. Being eternity-minded. You know, there's a, there's a thing I believe in being kingdom-minded, and they're very similar. But being eternity-minded, meaning getting a revelation from God about eternity and what eternity is. And when you get that, when you get a revelation of what eternity is, then... then Suddenly the things of this world don't, I don't want to say mean as much to you, but I don't know what the right, the right word, influence you as much maybe, or uh, worry you as much maybe, or when you're eternity minded. So he's saying here, yet we suffer now as nothing compared to the glory that he will reveal to us later. Verse 19 says, for all creation is waiting eagerly for that future day when God will reveal who his children really are. Against its will, all creation was subjected to God's curse. You know, people... Let me see, can I go there? Uh, I'm, I'm all for... I'm all for saving, saving the earth. You know, people want to put in you know, solar energy and clean energy and going green and, and you know, picking up your trash and doing all... I, I'm all for that, but, but 
the reason the earth is groaning is because of the fall of Adam and Eve. And guess what? This earth is going to be renewed by fire one day. So we can do efforts, yes, and that's all good and well, but it ain't going to save the planet. I'm all for recycling. You want to put your can in a certain... That's fine. I think that's wonderful. I think it's tremendous. But that ain't going to save the planet. There's only one thing that will save the planet. That's God. And it's all going to be burnt up one day anyway. Anyways. All right. I'll get off my soapbox. Um... Verse 20, against this will, all creation was subjected to God's curse, but with eager hope. Even creation hopes. That, you know, that should, we as children of God should always have hope. And if we can understand even creation hopes, we can hope. Amen. Uh, the creation looks forward to the day when it will join God's children in glorious freedom from death and decay. For we know that all creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. And we believers also groan. Even, listen to this, even though we have the Holy Spirit within us as a foretaste of future glory, we still groan, we still go through things, we still suffer, we still have trials, we still have tribulations in this world. For we long for our bodies to be released from sin and suffering. We too wait with eager hope for the day when God will give us our full rights as His adopted children, including the new bodies He has promised us. We talked about our glorified bodies. I believe it was last week. We'll be walking through walls and all kinds of crazy stuff. Verse 24, We were given this hope when we were saved. If we already have something, we don't need to hope for it. But if we look forward to something we don't yet have, we must wait patiently and confidently. And the Holy Spirit helps us in our weakness. Who is the source of all comfort? God is. For example, we don't know what God wants us to pray for, but the Holy Spirit prays for us with groanings that cannot be expressed in words. And the Father who knows all hearts knows what the Spirit is saying. For the Spirit pleads for us believers in harmony with God's own will. And we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to His purpose for them. Listen, we know, and I hope you understand, and if you don't, let the Holy Spirit give you revelation about this. God doesn't cause calamity in your life to teach you anything, but He will use it when it happens. He will use it. He doesn't cause it, but He will use it. And one of those uses is when you go through something, He'll let you share that with someone else that may be going through something similar and give them hope by what you're sharing with them that, hey, I went through this and I came out of it. I got on the other side of it and you can too. Amen? He will use your pain and suffering to save others from the same or to help them out of that place of pain and suffering. If, and here's the big if, if we'll let Him. You are a free will being. You make your own choices. You can make your own choice. You can choose. You can choose. But you can turn it around also. You can turn it around. You can turn it around. Remember the story uh, or the account in the Bible uh, of Joseph and how his brothers cast him down in the pit and sold him into slavery and then lied to their father that he was dead. And then he went to Egypt and he was... Uh, 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 Enslaved, and I guess enslaved there or put to, to work there and, and rose to notoriety. And, and then when the brothers came back, and you know, they found out who he was and, and they were so just, I mean, pierced to their heart. I mean, just it, it devastated them. And he said, look, what was meant for evil, God turned around and, and, and 
and, and used it for good because then Egypt became uh, a, a safe place for all of Israel, for Jacob and his whole family. And they, they blossomed in Israel. He gave them the choice part of the land and they blossomed and they grew to a mighty nation. So he can turn things around. He is the God of the turnaround. He can turn things around in your life. He can turn things around in your life. Let's look at 2 Corinthians chapter 12. And this will be out of the Amplified. <clears throat> Let me start in verse 6. 2 Corinthians 12, 6. This is Paul talking to the church at Corinth. He says, Should I desire to boast, I shall not be a witless bragger. For I shall be speaking the truth, but I abstain from it so that no one may from a higher estimate of me than form a higher estimate of me than is justified by what he sees in me or hears from me. And to keep me from being puffed up and too much elated, the exceeding greatness uh, preeminence of these revelations, there was given me a thorn, a splinter in the flesh, a messenger of Satan. What was the thorn? A messenger from who? Satan, okay, thank you. A messenger from Satan to rack and buffet and harass me. Did it come from God? No, no. To keep me from being excessively exalted. Verse 8, Three times I called upon the Lord and besought Him about this and begged that it might depart from me. But He said to me, oh, and everybody loves to quote this, I do too, my grace or my favor and loving kindness and mercy is enough for you. It's sufficient against any danger and enables you to bear the trouble manfully. Whatever you're going through, whatever you go through in the future, whatever you've been through in the past, you can bear it. He's given you the strength to bear it because of His grace. His grace is sufficient for you. He says, for my strength and power are made perfect. They're fulfilled and completed and show themselves most effective in your weakness. In your weakness. Therefore I, as Paul again talking, will all the more gladly glory in my weaknesses and infirmities that the strength and power of Christ, the Messiah, may rest, yes, may pitch a tent over and dwell upon me. Verse 10, so for the sake of Christ, I am well pleased and take pleasure in infirmities, insults, hardships, persecutions, perplexities, and distresses. For when I am weak, in human strength, then am I truly strong, able, powerful, in divine strength. And that is why we must trust God. That is why we must understand, have a revelation that He is the source of all comfort. You know, in this world, we, we turn to so many different things to comfort us. For some, it's food. For some, it's TV. You know, for some, it's laying in their hammocks. For some, it's getting in the water. You know, whatever it may be, we all turn to something for comfort. But if, if you could receive today the revelation that God is the source of all comfort, He's the source of it. It may come through some of those things, but He is the source of it. And when you turn to the source and like we just read, where the Holy Spirit is praying uh, according to God's own will for us, for you, in your time of need, right on time. Whatever you're going through, if you can believe that, that the Holy Spirit is praying to God in the will of God for you in that instant, and you understand that God is the source of your comfort, then you receive comfort at that moment. No matter what it is. No matter what it is. Am I helping somebody today? It says the grace of God is enough. And if we will recognize this in the midst of the trial, all will be well. All will be well. So, does it give new meaning to the phrase, count it all joy when you suffer? Trials and tribulations for Jesus. Count it all joy.
Because as we suffer and are weak in our flesh, we are strong in our spirit. And we are able to withstand all the wiles of the enemy. All the wiles of the enemy. You know, he has plans and attacks and tactics, uh, deception, traps planned for you, but you have the victory over him. We can withstand all the thorns, all the attacks of the enemy, knowing that Christ is for us. And if He is for us, <laughs> who can be against us? Who? Nobody. Nobody. Me be defeated? It's impossible. It is impossible for me to be defeated when I know that God is my source. He is the source of my comfort. He is the source. But what does Jesus say? What is his encouragement? When he's talking to the disciples, he, you know, he's saying, he's, he's giving them the, uh, the analogy that he's the vine and we are the branches. And what does he say? He says, apart from me, the vine, your source, you can do nothing. So we have to be vitally joined to the Christ, to the vine. We have to be vitally joined to Him because apart from Him, John tells us we can do nothing. We must abide. We must abide in Christ. And when it says when we abide in Him, we will bear much fruit. We will bear much fruit. Now let's finish up Romans 8. Did you keep your finger in Romans 8 there? We're going to finish it up. And I'll wrap it up with that. Romans 8, we're in verse 29. <clears throat> it says, For God knew His people in advance, and He chose them to become like His Son, so that His Son would be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And having chosen them, He called them to come to Him. And having called them, He gave them right standing with Himself. And having given them right standing, He gave them His glory. Past tense. Gave. Gave. Gave them His glory. Now I have a, a sneaky suspicion. I haven't talked to Reggie, what he plans for sharing, but... I can only imagine it's going to have something to do with the glory. Because we have right standing with God, He gave us His glory. I, I don't know about you, but that's all inspiring for me. And, and, and I just, you know, brought it back to, to my remembrance, though. The account of, I think it was Elijah, where he stuffed, stuffed him in the crevice. and He said, you won't be able to see my face, but allow my glory to pass by you. And the fact that he has given us that glory through the precious blood of Jesus, through his sacrifice, and that is why you are worthy to receive the glory. Not because of you and what you've done. Not because of your works. Listen, there's... Uh, I know I said I was going to end with that. There's, a, a, I think, a misconception in the body of Christ about works. And, and a lot of people quote that verse, I believe it's in James, where it talks about... Um, he says, uh, you say you have faith and I have works, but... Uh, I'll show you my faith by my works. I think that's how it goes. And, you know, a lot of people, a lot of people think, and if you read the book of Romans, I know you all, all have because we put you on assignment several months ago to read Romans. We know that we're not saved by works. And a lot of people equate that with works like, you know, I don't, you know, just physical things. I got to pray more. I got to give more. I got to go to church more. You know, I got to uh, help the elderly more. I got to do 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 more. That's not the works he's talking about. 
in that passage. If you, if you research it out, and, and I'd be happy to, for you to come and tell me I'm wrong, but if you research it out, if you research it out, it's talking about believing. Believing the Word of God as the Word of God. It is talking about faith. <laughs> it is talking about uh, having faith and then making it actionable based on what you believe. It's, it's talking about walking your faith out. In other words, you know, I can... Uh, let's see. I, I started a book. I started writing a book back in 2000. I've always wanted to write a book. I started a book back in 2012. I got 17 whole pages done. 17 whole pages. Now, I don't know about you, but that's a long way from a novel. And so, you know, if I don't, I can say I'm going to write a book. I even have some evidence of starting a book. But if I don't put pen to paper... It ain't never going to happen. It ain't never going to happen. That's the whole faith. Showing you my faith by works. Are you obedient to do what the Lord has told you to do? Whether in His Word or through His Holy Spirit. Are you obedient to do it? Do you believe the Word of God by faith enough to put it into practice. I can believe that I'm an author all I want. But until I get to the point where it says the end, <laughs> guess what? <laughs> I ain't. Mm. Actionable. Do we believe it enough to make it actionable in our life? You know, when, we, when the Word says He sent His Word and healed them, you can believe all day long that you're the healed. Or at least say it. But do you put that into action? Do you actually... And I shouldn't have said you can believe all... You, you can hear what, and see what the Word says about you. But do you believe it? That's the way I should... Do you believe it? You know, it says that, that uh, you have all authority to, to cast out demons, to lay hands on the sick and watch them recover. You have that authority. And, and, and you can read that. You can hear people say it. But until you put it into practice... Faith. Faith. Hmm. That was just a little sidebar for somebody. Maybe for me. Thank you, Lord. So, where are we at? I believe the Lord is wanting us to get a put to a place beyond the pain and suffering and emotional angst and distress that we all experience at one time or another. And get to the other side so that we can share our victory with others and bear fruit in our life and allow it to bear fruit in their life. So that He can get us up to a position that we are the light. We are the light of the world. We, the church, you and I, born again believers, we are the light of the world. And without us, Without you and me, the darkness will overcome. There is a time. We talked about it. Listen, when the church, when you and I, born again believers, the church is raptured out of here, that uh, the entity of the church, us together, will be gone and darkness will overcome. That's the great tribulation. That is the time of tremendous pain and suffering. And yes, it's dealing with Israel mainly. 
But we're taken out of here. The light is taken out, so darkness will overcome. But <laughs> we'll come back. And guess who will be with us? Jesus Himself. We will be victorious again over this earth. For a thousand years, and I didn't tell you this, but at the end of that thousand years, the enemy of our soul, Satan himself, will be allowed to influence in the earth again. But it won't be long. He'll call those people out. Y'all know what call means? C-U-L-L, cool. He'll get them out. He'll expose them. They'll be wiped out and that'll be the end. And then, for you planet people, the earth will be renewed by fire <laughs> and rejuvenated. But isn't that, doesn't that give you hope? Doesn't that give you encouragement? Doesn't that help you knowing that He is the source of all of your comfort? So seek him first. Seek Him and His kingdom first. And then all those other things that we consider on our day-to-day -day plates will be taken care of. Amen? Father, I know we've covered a lot today, but I believe, Holy Spirit, You can seal that to our spirit. And help us rightly divide the Word of God so that we know what You are saying to us. And Father, even if it was just one person that took this to heart and really really is chewing on it right now, really is it's exposing some things in their life that, that they know they need to change. They know that they need to come in, in alignment with what Your Word says about that. And, and I believe that You're giving them the, 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 the courage the boldness to make those changes in their life. And, and they're not acting out of uh, uh, you know, their own ability. They are acting out of their belief in what your word says, that you are their source. And just like we read in Psalm 91, you are their high tower. You are their place of refuge. Oh, the angels are ministering spirits for them. You will keep them. Hold them. Watch over them. Keep them from the plagues and the pestilence and the evil. Hmm. Holy Spirit, give us revelation of this. Because we want to bear fruit. We want you to prune off that which is dead and no good for us. We welcome the pruning. It may be painful, but we welcome it because we want to bear more and more fruit. So cut away. Cut away that we may bear fruit. And Holy Spirit, only as you can, in the midst of our suffering, our pain, our trial, whatever it may be we're going through now, Show me. Show me how to use that to help another brother or sister in need. Show me how to share that with someone that needs to hear the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ, that He is the answer. He is their Savior. And if they will put their trust in Him, He will be their deliverer. And if they continue to trust in Him, he will be their source of all comfort. So I pray that everyone under the sound of my voice today is comforted by you as only you can in every situation and circumstance. That you are right on time. All the time. And you are good. All the time. We thank you for your goodness and mercy as it follows us all the days of our life. In Jesus' mighty name, amen.
we're going to have a time of, of giving where you're sharing your your tithes and offerings and, and remembering the mission bowl up here. But as we do that as well, I, I just want, if, if, if you feel led, I want to uh, pray for you um, in agreement with something maybe the Holy Spirit has shared with you today. Or if you need uh, uh, further comfort in some area, then I want to be here to, to do that. So as we take up the offering, uh, if you'll come and pray, we'll play something. And uh, I want to pray with you if you, if you need prayer. Right it's not just a story.